Yeah, well, I think, you know, we're talking about the early days when uh, there was absolutely no communication uh, openly between us and the Soviets. We had a general idea what the Soviets were doing. But I don't know, is, do you ever remember getting a briefing with anybody in the CIA uh, that would, would give us a... Uh, an inkling as to what the Soviets were doing back in those days? Well, I think for many people today, they, they know the, the situation today in the 1990s as one in which the Soviet Union's all broken up now. What were we ever all that worried about? But back in those days, we looked at this as literal survival of the United States and of the free world. And the communist conspiracy all over the world and all, and you could go into all hours of, of discussion of that. But that's the kind of environment we were in. And I think then we had looked at the United States as being the world's superior technical power by far. Anything America wanted to do technically, we could do. And all at once, for the very first time, here was this communist empire that we had looked at as being sort of well behind us. And here they outdid the United States of America. <coughs> and even Eisenhower talked about that little grapefruit up there going around as though yeah, we should maybe, ignore maybe. it. But it was, a, it was an enormous technical accomplishment that we had tried and been unable to do up to that point. And we looked at it at that time as though this technical accomplishment might be used by the Soviets to further their ends all over the world, and it was very important. And so we were extremely anxious in the early days of the program to catch up and, and, and exceed the, the John, Russians, the Soviets. Wasn't only Sputnik. You've got to remember that context. Wasn't only Sputnik. John, if you remember, Yuri Gagarin flew on April sure. the 12th. Al didn't fly until May the 5th, yeah. and, and we didn't put you in orbit, our first American in orbit, until February oh, of the following year. Oh, yeah. You know, there's an important element here. We were inspired in those days, of course, by curiosity that inspires all exploration, but the competition that the Soviet Union presented us was a powerful driver. We didn't have much intelligence uh, from CIA, but we got some from Life magazine. They had photographs that showed us what they were doing. And I think to a man we were pleased to see their accomplishments, but it was still a, a, a race that was driven by not only a need for security, but a, a need to establish our international prestige. They have all of the major firsts in the beginning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, question up, yeah. up to that First point. lady, <coughs> first <coughs> face walk, I first flight. Bank Absolutely. Bank well, we were getting ready to go when Al made our first flight, the suborbital flight. And I think it, it sort of came home to us after that flight how important the American people thought this was. Yeah. And we hadn't quite realized that. We came back to Washington for this parade and we were down there. And I remember we were all sort of wide eyed and about just like the excitement of the crowd and everybody when we were in the parade just sort of washed over you. And then later on, after my flight, that was the first orbital flight for us, and we thought we were catching up. And the response of people was sort of overwhelming. It was, it was beyond anything that any of us had foreseen before. And it was sort of those, they were the turning points where I think people sort of saw, okay, we're coming back from this Soviet superiority. And that's what had everybody was so excited at that time. And it was, uh, far more public interest in it than I think than we had realized before. Continuing on what you said, I think that certainly we had the feeling that we were catching up during the Gemini program, but you really didn't know we were ahead and we were that much smarter until until Apollo itself came along. And, True. Actually, and the Soviets it, tried, but uh, it became obvious they couldn't do it. I think what really True. came home to everybody was during Apollo Soyuz to see how far behind their technology uh, really was. Since. Since we're talking about that, and having had the opportunity to, to look at the Earth from a long way away, of course, you had a pretty good shot at it yourself, and you got out pretty far. But, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the Earth from the moon, you realize, as you were saying, John, how fragile it really is. Because, you know, here we think it's a huge place, and uh, you look at it from uh, from that distance, and it's really only about that big. It's yeah. only four times as large as uh, as the moon as we see it. And you think of all the billions of people that are living down here, yeah. and uh, what they're doing to the environment. And uh, you begin to think, well, you know, maybe we ought to start considering what we're how we're going to survive on this planet for the next few years. 
course, I'm only worried about half a generation, but <laughs> a lot of folks are going to have to worry about it for hundreds of years to come. If we're going to continue to increase the population, we're going to have to think about some other planet to populate, too. Yeah. There's another phrase that I think is appropriate to the time. Jack Eddy coined it. He said, uh, the Earth is in need because of our, of our damage, the damage we've done. The Earth is in need of intensive care. That's true. <clears throat> You're the only guy around the table that had the chance to go to the moon with uh, Al Bean and, and, uh, and our buddy. <laughs> Charles? <laughs> yeah, Charles N. Conrad, Jr. Yeah, tell, them, tell us about that. I, I can't tell you, Al. There's three <laughs> Navy guys in, uh, in one, one tub. <laughs> uh, I, that was a, one of my great experiences, flying with those guys. We were very, very close personal friends. Had been for many years before we even got in the program. And uh, I think in our training, we, we learned to, to appreciate each other's contribution and think alike, react alike. We communicated without speaking. Uh, which is kind of a, a rarity, I, I think. And we just had a lot of fun. The pressure was really off. We were the second flight to the moon and not the first. So that, that pressure was off. So we, we had a lot of fun, Al, during the training and during the flight. Yeah, we, we had that. Probably the most exciting part of the whole flight was getting struck by lightning during launch. Happened twice. Happened about 32 seconds and 53 seconds. I don't know why those numbers stick in my mind. <laughs> but that really caught our attention, and we lost all the electrical power from the fuel cells. Fortunately, the batteries picked up the load, and, and we were able to get things back online. Well, we, we got the electrical system back online during the boost phase, and the only thing we had remaining to do in orbit to get clearance to go ahead and do TLI was realign the platform and make sure that nothing was damaged in the navigational system. Once that was accomplished and done, we were, we were on our way. I hit two golf balls. The first one I did hit pretty flush with one hand. It went a couple hundred yards. And the second one I <laughs> swung a little harder, shanked it, and it rolled in the crater about 40 yards away. We've been back about a week, and I'm telling everybody how well I hit these things. And we come in, uh, you know, we're still in quarantine. The boys would come in and debrief a certain segment of the flight every morning. We finished breakfast, and his crew came in the, from the from the photo lab. And some bright young guy looks at me. He says, uh, "How far did you hit them?" Oh, I said, "A couple hundred yards." So he puts on this little film. It's a camera is mounted in the window of the co-pilot's co-pilot's window, and it's shooting as they're coming down to make the landing. Right? And he stops at about 300 feet in the air, and he says, "Up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little crater there." He says, "Absolutely, totally perfect crater. Nothing in it or anything." And he goes on down, lands, and I'm thinking to myself, now why did he do that? Well, the next <laughs> film he's got is the takeoff, right? Stuff. In the same camera, same window, takeoff, dust settles down, he stops at 300 feet here, and he says, see that little crater in the upper right-hand corner? He says, see that little white spot in the <laughs> crater? He said, that's actually 42 yards away from where Shepard is. <laughs> it was uh, ice that condensed on the side, and when I stowed the camera, with uh, Velcro on the hatch, here came this yeah, stream of, quote, fireflies. Well, the only well, thing wasn't your fascination with the flyer flies would be, would be partly responsible for the overshoot that you had? You well, got... possibly, but you know, it's hard to realize this now. There were so many unknowns in the early days. And this is a fact of the matter. We were really not sure after John flew whether or not there were critters, living critters, out there somewhere. Yeah. We really didn't know it. Well, I think John described one time as ever fly was an OG whiz fly in those days. Yeah, well, they were. <laughs> we, we were fortunate being the first generation that's ever had the opportunity to move tiny little baby steps off this planet and do some, some very basic research. And it's that research and what went into the program in, in research and what you learn in space that makes the whole thing valuable to the whole American people, in fact, the whole world. And is it uh, Sally Ride's mission to planet Earth that she talked about, or all the other things, or new materials on board, or computer technologies and techniques? As far as the benefit of the program, we look at it and we remember things where we had a personal experience, but we're now able to travel reliably, reasonably reliably, off, off of the 
off of this earth of ours for the very first time and do the research in microgravity of new materials and glass and, and uh, just a whole host of the pharmaceuticals, things that are of value to people right here on earth. I think that's an important thing to remember too.